What is up everybody? Tegan here with High Point Scientific. We got our hands on the Skywatcher GTI and we know what you guys care about and that is performance. So we're going to be putting this mount through its paces. I'm going to be testing this mount's performance with a couple of different scopes. I'll be sharing with you my entire testing process along with the results. Stay tuned. So first we're gonna start off with a simple unboxing video followed by a quick setup guide. Now this video may be a little bit longer than our typical videos, so feel free to look down at the chapters on the timeline and skip ahead to whatever section it is you're really interested in. So in the box comes a tripod, the mount head itself, a pier extension, a counterweight bar, a five pound counterweight, and a USB cable for computer control. So the setup process is similar to any other equatorial mount and it's quite simple. First you want to open the tripod and put it on as level ground as possible and then attach the spreader bar. Next you want to screw in the bottom of the pier head to the top of the tripod head. Next you want to pull out the top of the pier head by loosening the three bolts and then you want to attach the pier head to the bottom of the mount head. From there you can put the mount head back into the top of the pier and tighten it back down. Adjust your latitude knob to match your imaging location. Next you want to attach your counterweight bar. Loosen the RA clutch and set the mount to your home position. Go ahead and slide on the counterweight and tighten that RA clutch back down. Add your imaging train to the declination axis and tighten it down with the thumb screw. Now you may want to go back and forth in balancing between the deck axis and the RA axis to really fine tune it because if you're imaging with a longer focal length or a heavier scope, this is going to be pretty critical. Okay, so before we dive into these performance tests, Skywatcher, as always, has integrated some awesome features into this mount. Let's take a look. First you have the onboard USB port. This allows for full computer control of all accessories and equipment through a laptop. More on this in a bit. Next, they have a hand controller port. For those who like to manually slew without the use of a smartphone or an app or a laptop, and those who may use this for visual work. Now this mount was built from the ground up to be a miniature equatorial mount. And the biggest difference that you may know to its predecessor, the Skywatcher Adventurer 2i, is that the Skywatcher GTI has full go-to capability. This functionality is going to completely eliminate the need for you to manually search and frame your targets. And this is definitely one of the main struggles that beginner astrophotographers have, finding and framing their target correctly. The GTI completely removes this learning curve due to the go-to functionality and it decreases your setup time significantly so you can start imaging sooner. Like the Star Adventure 2i, the GTI does come with integrated Wi-Fi. This comes in handy when you want to control your mount from your smartphone. Integrated in the mount head itself is room for eight AA batteries. If you plan on taking this mount to the furthest and most remote locations, you can rely on only eight AA batteries to power this mount. This means you can possibly operate this entire unit without a single cable. Included in bottom of both the pier extension and the mount head itself is a 3 8 16 adapter. This is great for those of you who own a photographic tripod. This means that you do not have to purchase the Skywatcher GTI package with the included tripod. You can just purchase the mount head on its own and use your own photographic tripod. If you look on the front of the mount head, you will see two different positions for where you can place your counterweight shaft. For those of you who live in lower latitudes, you can adjust the counterweight bar to the upper position. If you're using an imaging train that requires your counterweight to be pushed to the very top of your counterweight shaft, you can also move your counterweight shaft to the upper position so that the counterweight itself doesn't run into the latitude adjustment knob. Another feature they've included is an auto guide port or an ST4 port. So for these tests, I do not use the ST4 port. I'm simply just using a USB port from the mount head to my laptop since I'm using my Windows operating system to control all of my equipment anyways. And lastly, they've included a 2.1 by 5.5 millimeter, just standard AC adapter port. So if you have a source of constant power, such as from a power tank or an extension cable, this is going to be especially useful for you. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about how to connect your mount to your laptop through the Skywatcher SendScan app. We'll be using the USB port on the mount to connect to our laptop. This means full automation. 
your focuser, your camera, your filter wheel. Any accessory that you have in your imaging system, no matter how complex, can be controlled through your USB port. I'm gonna mention two different drivers and an app that you need to download, and all of those links are in the description below. First, you need to make sure that you download your ASCOM driver from ASCOMstandards.com. So go to skywatcher.com and under support, you will find downloads. Click on the SendScan app and choose Windows Program SendScan App Pro app version 1.19.18. After it's downloaded, go ahead and extract the files and then run the program. You will do the same for the ASCOM driver. This is called ASCOM driver for SendScan app version 1.3.0 or the most recent version. Go ahead and simply accept and install and you're finished here downloading the driver. Now you can go ahead and power on your GTI and connect your USB cable from the mount to your laptop. Open the app in your laptop and under the settings tab, go to connections and change your connection type to serial. You should then be able to hit connect in your app and then from there you will have full control within the app to control your mount. So if you don't plan on using a third party software to control your mount, the SendScan app is actually really cool. It enables you to do multiple types of star alignments. You can choose separate stars or deep sky objects that you'd like to view. You can also do a deep sky tour under tonight's best. You can identify targets. You can do PPEC. You have camera control and other diagnostics. It is a very well thought out app, but in this situation, I'm only going to be using this app to connect my mount I'm going to be using sequence generator pro to run all of my tests so sequence generator pro is my go-to software for any imaging session and this is just what I'm personally used to so I was able to open sequence generator pro and I have all of my equipment and profiles selected prior to mount connection in the drop down menu under your mount selection panel it should read send scan app you do want to make sure that you connect through the send scan app first otherwise you won't be able to connect to your third-party software so Let's get to the testing phase of the Skywatcher GTI. For these tests, I will be running the RedCap 51 and the Aperture 72 EDR doublet. Red Cat 51 has a focal length of 250 millimeters and the Apertura 72 EDR has a focal length of 430 millimeters. So the purpose behind the performance test is to see how long my maximum guided exposure can be and how long my maximum tracked or unguided exposure can be for both systems. So I will be using the same exact imaging train for both tests. That's the 294 monochrome with a ZWO filter wheel, Astrodon hydrogen hydrogen alpha filters, astrodon luminance filters, an off-axis guider, and a QHY5L guide camera. Now, if you'd like to stay tuned here, I'm going to show you how I have everything attached to my mount from my cameras to my laptop. I have my mount attached to my laptop via USB direct connection from the USB port on the mount. I have my filter wheel and my guide camera attached to the USB hub on the back of the 294 monochrome camera, which is connected directly to my laptop via USB 3.0. Both my camera and mount are being powered by AC adapters from Apertura. For the first performance test, we will be starting with the RedCat 51. So balancing the RedCat 51, since it's so light, was rather easy, but I did run into one issue. The problem that I ran into is that since the scope is so short, my filter wheel would run into the mount itself when I was trying to frame properly. A set of dovetail risers would help this issue. For now, I tried to point my filter wheel upwards to keep my scope as balanced as possible in the declination axis. Now I had everything ready to go, it was time for a polar alignment. I pointed my mount north and I used SharpCat Pro. The SharpCat Pro Polar Alignment method is easy as ever and I followed the Polar Alignment Wizard until I achieved a Polar Alignment reading of excellent. So balancing and Polar Alignment are finished. I put the mount in home position with the Red Cat facing towards Polaris. It's 2.30 in the morning and that means that Messier 13, the beautiful Great Hercules Cluster, is upwards at about 60 degrees altitude. tested a series of tracking only unguided sub-exposures at 30 seconds, 1 minute, 
two minutes, three minutes, and five minutes. So I briefly took a look at the unguided exposures and I was pleasantly surprised. And before I started pixel peeping those stars, I was way too eager to test the guided performance of this mount. So I ran auto guiding calibration, PhD guiding assistant, made sure everything was on par, and I pointed toward the Seder region, the Butterfly Nebula. So from here, I started with a 15 minute guided sub exposure. Now a 15 minute sub exposure is typically longer than the standard two, three, five, 10 minute sub exposures that a lot of astrophotographers like to use with a CMOS camera. But again, I wanted to push this mount's capabilities. The results speak for themselves, but let's talk about the Aperture 72 EDR. Okay, so first I went on to balance the 72 EDR and it was easy in the declination axis, but when I balanced in the right ascension axis is when I ran into a problem. I needed an additional five pound counterweight. So I just slid the counterweight all the way to the bottom, tightened it, and I caught it a night. There was really nothing else that I could do, but if you were in a pinch and you had some tape, then you could duct tape something to the counterweight to help balance out the RA axis. For the tracking only unguided sub exposure test, I pointed my scope again to Messier 13, the Great Hercules Cluster, and ran a series of 30 second, one minute, two minute, three minute, and five minute exposures. Morning was actually approaching as it was about four o'clock in the morning morning when I slewed to the Seder region with my hydrogen alpha filter to test a guided sub exposure. Again, I went straight for a 15 minute sub exposure to push this mount. The results were awesome. First, I'm going to share with you my guide graphs for the Red Cat 51 as well as the results for the Red Cat 51. And then we'll move on to the Aperture 72 EDR. When guiding with the Red Cat 51, I had a total RMS error of 0.89 arc minutes over a period of 400 pulses. My longest possible guided exposure was 15 minutes. I was able to achieve perfectly round stars within this 15 minute sub exposure, and this was constant over a series of 15 minute sub exposures. This was highly impressive. Next was the tracking result. In the 30 second, the 60 second, the two minute, the three minute, and five minute exposure lengths, I was able to achieve round stars unguided. So if you don't have an auto guiding system, if your polar alignment is just spot on and as is your balance, you're gonna be able to achieve some pretty long exposure times with a 250 millimeter lens, such as the Red Cat 51. If you have an even shorter focal length lens, like an 85 millimeter or even like a 100 millimeter prime lens, you could push these sub exposure times even higher should your skies allow it. Now let's take a look at the results from the Aperture 72 EDR. So one of the first things that struck me as so impressive during my test with the 72 EDR was the fact that my guide graph read a total RMS error of 0.67 arc minutes over a period of 400 pulses. Now this was better than the Red Cat. So I attribute this to a change in polar alignment after troubleshooting with Sequence Generator Pro. I did have to return my mount to the home position several times. And I think it was around that time is when I probably bumped the mount and adjusted polar alignment. So I can only assume that during the testing of my Red Cat 51, the polar alignment was only subpar. With the Aperture 72 EDR, I was able to achieve 15 minute subs guided consistently. As far as unguided exposures go, I was only really able to achieve consistent 30 second exposures. That being said, I did compile 30 minutes worth of data of 30 second exposures, and I was pretty impressed with the results. If you collect enough data using 30 second exposures, you can still increase your signal and decrease your noise. The more data you collect, the better. I mainly attribute the short exposure times to one, the focal length and the fact that I was unbalanced in the right ascension axis. The Red Cat 51 is a very light scope and it was very well balanced in both axes, which is why I think I was able to achieve five minutes sub exposures unguided. So given the test results, if you have the Skywatcher GTI and you have a short focal length doublet or a triplet refractor or a longer focal length lens anywhere up to about 450 millimeters, 
you may be able to expect results like this. Now the mounts vary, polar alignment, conditions, everything, you know, it varies from astrophotographer to and setup to setup. But if you have something like the William Optic Xenostar doublets or, you know, something within that short focal length range, this may be a perfect option for some portable astrophotography. Generally speaking, the setup of this mount was simple. Connecting everything to my laptop was extremely easy and very quick. Now there are two things that I learned that are important to know when using this mount. First, before you do any star alignment, before you do any go-to, any slewing or any plate solving, you have to make sure that your mount is in the home position with counterweights down and the telescope facing towards Polaris. Otherwise, your initial go-to or your slew is going to be that far off if your mount is not at the home position. And secondly, the only problem that I ran into actually had to do with plate solving. That initial go-to and plate solve from the home position worked nearly every time. Plate solving was great, but it was when I was switching from target to target get say Messier 13 to the Seder region. My mount would slew, it would plate solve, but it wouldn't correct to make sure that object was perfectly centered. It would fail multiple times over with no correction. But then I would slew back to Messier 13 and it would work perfectly fine. This happened over a period of a few nights. Now this may be fixed with a firmware update. It could be user error. I'm just not sure. If you have any recommendations, please let us know in the comments below. It would be very helpful to other viewers as well as to our team should we have this question arise the future. Other than that, my experience with this mount was quite flawless. And I think those of you who are new to this hobby and have an interest in upgrading from a photographic tripod to a fully go-to system but want something portable, you can't go wrong with the Skywatcher GTI. It's going to perform and it's going to provide you with some excellent results. The GTI is quite literally the most portable equatorial mount on the market. The full go-to capabilities is the central feature that separates it from its predecessor, the Skywatcher Star Adventurer 2i, which makes it the perfect mount for the astrophotographer on the go. And again, the biggest thing is you don't have to frame and search for your target. You just click and go and it saves so much time, especially if you're not used to that kind of automation. All right, well, that is it. We thank you so much for tuning in and we really hope that you enjoyed this test over the Skywatcher Star Adventure GTI. If you have any questions at all about performance or parts or anything related to this mount, please let us know in the comments below or reach out to us at highpointscientific.com and our non-commissioned product advisors will be more than happy to assist you. Additionally, I've written a detailed article over my entire experience with the GTI and you can find that link in the description below. Again, we thank you so much for tuning in and clear skies.